I don't know about you, but I actually used to believe that most other RPGs besides D&D and maybe Pathfinder were just too hard to learn, or they were only good for one-shots, or you couldn't really make a unique and customizable character in those other games. And I seriously used to think that all old-school RPGs were like, you play a wizard with one spell and one hit point, and they get killed in the first dungeon, and you like it. Because that's how some people talk about these games, but all of those misconceptions were shattered when I ran my first one-shot of what is now my current favorite RPG. Dungeon Crawl Classics. My players and I laughed harder than I've seen in a session since my earliest days of D&D, back when we really didn't know what we were doing. But this time, we were playing by the rules of this book. DCC has built in the kind of fun I like to have at the table, and I want to share this fun with you. Because I'm Bob, this is where we learn how to have more fun playing RPGs together, and right here at the top of the video, I'd appreciate it if you leave a comment sharing something you're curious to learn about DCC, or just like the video, because that support is how we're going to boost other RPGs and get more players curious about the wide world of tabletop games outside of just Dungeons & Dragons. Which as a game I still love by the way. And since most of us are more familiar with Dungeons & Dragons, why don't we start exploring DCC with its extremely convenient opening section, How is this game different from what I have played before? If you want to follow along, I linked the free PDF quick start rules down in the description. But this introduction in my more recent printing of the core book compares DCC to 5e. It says that this game also uses a d20 versus dc for most rolls, but instead of 5e advantage and disadvantage, you'll roll a bigger or smaller die, like a d24 or d14. We'll talk more about these weird dice in a minute, but don't worry, you don't necessarily need them, and this game still does use flat modifiers as well. Along with the funky dice, a common theme of DCC is to rely more on randomization over memorization, which I really appreciate as a GM. In fact, the default method of character creation is for each player to roll up three to four random characters, then run them all through an adventure and stick with the most powerful or most lucky survivors. Surprisingly, that trial by fire turns those random characters into beloved, hard-fought characters that you'll enjoy playing as much as ones you had spent days and days planning out. But you can still customize these characters, and of course, you can create characters however you want. One other difference for character creation that I initially wasn't so sure about, but have totally grown to appreciate, is, quote, Classes and races are one in the same. You are a wizard or an elf. So think about this. The human character classes of DCC, wizard, warrior, cleric, and thief, are the core classes of D&D. Wizard, fighter, cleric, rogue. Every other D&D class is just a variation or combination of these iconic fantasy archetypes. However, some of those modern variations are just as awesome as these fantasy archetypes, and in DCC, each class takes the most powerful and most thematic abilities of related classic and modern character concepts and condenses them into a single rich class that feels intuitive and easy to learn because it taps into what you already know. Then together with your background and a few freely customizable character features, you can still create incredibly unique and memorable characters that you'll love to play. We'll break down all seven classes' core features in another video, but know that the three non-human character classes of DCC, elves, halflings, and dwarves, again, only the most iconic fantasy peoples going all the way back to Tolkien and the folklore before him, are just as thematic. Elves in DCC are immune to magical sleep, can sense if there's a nearby secret door, and have a slight aversion to iron. Dwarves can smell gold and gems and naturally detect hidden structures and stonework, and halflings are sneaky, small, and very lucky. And this might be the last foundational difference to the character mechanics of 5e. Luck is its own ability score, and every character is created with a unique lucky sign, almost like a zodiac or like the blessings in Skyrim that you can get from shrines. In this case, that lucky sign lets you apply your luck modifier to a certain kind of roll. And you know what? I was wrong. The last huge difference from 5e is the epic magic system of Dungeon Crawl Classics. Spellcasters can have spell duels and burn points from their ability scores to boost their rolls, 
because exactly like martial classes make a check whenever they attack, spellcasters make a roll whenever they cast a spell. And each spell has a huge table of possible effects with fun and sometimes dangerous things that can happen if a spell misfires, as well as increasingly powerful spell effects for rolling high on your spell check. It's very cool, and that's really gotta be its own video or two at some point, but along with spellcasting, the relationship between clerics and their deities and wizards and their patrons, like 5e warlock patrons, actually matters in DCC. Partially because these gods' alignments actually specialize your character's abilities, but mainly because these deities and patrons often provide new quests and awesome role-playing opportunities. They're just more involved in the game. So that's the foundation of Dungeon Crawl Classics. Now I'm going to try to build on a bunch of those cool things and just tell you about some of the exciting ideas behind DCC's unforgettable character creation process. So even if this is the only DCC video you ever watch, you'll be inspired to at least borrow a little something from this game. I really think it has that much to offer, and I'm kind of shocked it doesn't get more attention on YouTube. Okay, you probably have a standard set of 7 RPG dice. D4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 20, and percentile. Maybe you even have the limited edition Bob World Builder metal set, only 500 sets made and only like 200 something left. Save 18% with a link below to support the channel. And you can play DCC with just those seven dice. But for the full Dungeon Crawl Classics experience, you may want to get the weird dice too. Conveniently, there is RollFunkyDice.com for free digital weird dice, or you can buy physical weird dice of what's called the Special Seven, basically just the weird dice to supplement your awesome Bob World Builder set, or you can get a complete set of DCC dice with a D3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10 percentile, 12, 14, 16, 20, 24, and 30. The complete set is also called the Dice Chain, and I recommend looking into it because just breaking out one of these weird dice in D&D for a homebrewed magic item or spell or weapon feature feels really cool. Like I described earlier, rather than advantage, some bonuses in the game will tell you to add plus 1d or plus 2d, as in roll a higher die of the chain, or minus 1d or 2d to roll a lower die on the chain. Overall, it's a fun way to mix things up, and that's everything you could possibly need to know about DCC dice. Let's talk about stats. The character abilities of DCC should be very familiar. Strength, you already know that one. Agility. Same as dexterity. Stamina. Same as constitution. Personality. Same as... Yeah, you guessed it. Charisma, but also kind of wisdom. Intelligence. You know that one. And luck, which you totally remember from earlier. See, you're already learning. The luck stat is one of my favorite innovations from DCC. For one reason, you can call for a luck roll whenever you're not sure what else to use. Is the bad guy standing directly beneath the chandelier? Maybe. Roll luck. Then the player typically has to just roll under their own luck score, such that luckier characters who have a higher luck score will naturally perform better on those rolls. You can also sacrifice points from your luck score to give yourself a one-time bonus to any roll. But outside of divine intervention, only naturally lucky halflings and thief characters can regain spent points of luck by resting. Halflings can even spend luck to grant their fellow adventurers a bonus, similar to 5e Inspiration. Your luck modifier also changes the nature of your character's critical hits and critical fumbles, which, yeah, critical fumbles have a mixed reputation and you don't have to use them, but I think DCC handles them well, and at the very least, the critical hit and fumble tables are filled with ideas for exciting things that can happen during combat in any fantasy RPG. Strike sweeps foe to the ground, inflict plus one d12 damage with this strike, and make another attack on prone enemy and dozens and dozens more cool moves. One more cool thing about luck is that each character gets a random lucky sign. For example, the Harsh Winter lucky sign lets your character add their luck mod to all their attack rolls. That's amazing. With the Speed of the Cobra sign, your character adds luck to all their initiative rolls. Nice. The funny part here is that your unlucky characters with a negative luck modifier could become worse at this roll or your lucky sign might grant you a bonus to a roll that doesn't matter for the class you end up choosing. Like, add your luck mod to all melee attacks, but you're a wizard. Personally, I would homebrew that with enough adventure, or perhaps divine intervention of some kind, 
these unlucky characters could someday change their stars and get a new lucky sign during the campaign, pretty much like how those shrines work in Skyrim. Now by default, so you don't have to do it this way, but it's fun and normal for Dungeon Crawl Classics, you roll completely random stats, 3d6 in order, and you do it for multiple characters per player because you typically start with three to four level zero characters. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Just like D&D, scores have modifiers, but in DCC, all the DCs and armor classes and really all the numbers, including these modifiers, have been reined in. So from a score of three to 18, you can only get a modifier of minus three to plus three without some special bonus. For example, when you roll a saving throw to dodge a trap, you might roll 1d20 plus your agility modifier plus a reflex bonus based on your class level. Yeah, saving throws will be familiar to 3.5e and Pathfinder players. There are only three kinds, fortitude based on strength, reflex based on agility, and willpower based on personality. I love the simplicity of only three types of saving throws because, let's be honest, there's no actual concrete difference between most charisma saves and wisdom saves or wisdom saves and intelligence saves. And again, in DCC, as your character levels up, they get bonuses to these saving throws from their class table in addition to their ability score modifiers. And for most important class-specific roles like warriors and their weapon attacks, casters and their spells, thieves and their sneaky skills, the character uses that ability score modifier plus their level or some other class specific bonus. So don't let those lower modifiers make you think DCC characters are a bunch of weaklings. Well, like I hinted at earlier, they do start out as literal level zero peasants. No class, hit points equal to 1d4 plus stamina modifier, usually wielding one trained weapon and some other piece of incredibly basic equipment that is sometimes hilarious. One character in my first session had a staff and a crowbar and a goose. And the goose died honorably. Remember, if that's too goofy for you, you can make characters however you want, but my group and the vast majority of groups who give this a try find the default method to be super entertaining. So you roll your random stats for three to four characters, roll their hit points, roll for a couple copper pieces, roll one random piece of equipment, then for their occupation. This occupation is not only their job as a peasant, but it comes with that one trained weapon and that other piece of equipment related to their job. And it technically determines their race too. For example, if you roll an occupation and get blacksmith, you're a human who is a blacksmith. But if you roll and get dwarven blacksmith, you're a dwarf who is a blacksmith. So this occupation is also like a character's background in terms of 5e, but only part of that background. The rest of their background is really this first adventure they're going to face at level zero. And if they survive, they become a level one adventurer. I love that because it means you get to play through and experience the most pivotal moment in your character's backstory with the rest of the party. And by the way, there is a level zero adventure included in the quick start rules and in the core rulebook, but the most popular level zero module is Sailors on the Starless Sea, and that's the one my group really enjoyed. Anyway, there are 100 character occupations listed in the core book, and GM willing, you can totally just pick whatever occupation you like, especially if you really have your heart set on playing a dwarf or an elf, for example. And you could even make up your own occupation really easily, since they're just a name, a weapon, and another piece of equipment. And if all that random generation feels tedious to you, it's actually quite a fast and entertaining process. But if you want the process to be even faster, you should use purplesorcerer.com to instantly create entire parties of level zero characters or higher level characters, or just automate a bunch of the otherwise random elements of DCC. Also, this feels like a good point to ask for your opinion in the comments. Like, how are you feeling about this game based on what you know so far? Does it feel fun? Does it feel funny? Maybe too funny for your taste? A lot of that might be my personal filter because it is still an old school RPG that can be as gritty as you want. So let me know. Ah uh, yes, the part of your level zero character that you're actually supposed to choose, your alignment. Lawful, neutral, or chaotic. In other words, you choose whether your character stands for unity, order, and civilization, or for disrupting order, undermining authority, and seeking power over the people around them. Or do they stand somewhere in between? 
For classes like Cleric, Wizard, Elf, and Thief, your choice of alignment is almost like a 5e subclass because it comes with certain abilities for your character. For the spellcasters, it affects what deities or patrons you can bond with, and for clerics, it also affects what creatures you can heal most effectively and which types of monsters are considered unholy for the purposes of turning unholy. For thieves, it affects which of their many sneaky skills they are expertly trained in. So like I've been trying to emphasize, DCC classes feel incredibly thematic and intuitive because each one is built on just two or three iconic features that evolve with the character as they gain levels, and most of them allow for a good deal of customization to make your character as unique or as specialized as you want. And if you like the sound of that, please like this video so I know to make more videos about DCC, then watch this one about the warrior class's main feature, share these with your game group to get them interested, and consider subscribing, maybe getting a cool set of both Bob World Builder dice, or even joining my Patreon, all as great ways to support the channel. Thank you for your support, and keep building.